Hello, it's great to be back with you. And we're going to be discussing today a truly epic moment in aviation history. It's a story that goes back more than 55 years, right into the 1960s. But the story's coming to an end this week because Boeing is delivering its final example of the 747 wide body airliner. Now we're gonna be talking to a well-respected aviation journalist and author. He's gonna be putting the 747 in context. He's gonna be talking to us about why it ranks as one of the most iconic aircraft ever. But perhaps most fascinatingly of all, I believe he's got some truly personal memories of his connection with the 747. Joining me today is uh, an aviation author and journalist who has huge experience in, in tracking the history of this incredible industry. Andreas Speed, thank you so much for being with us today. Normally you're based in Hamburg, I believe, but uh, I can see it's, it's quite a bit warmer where you are. I think you're in South Africa uh, getting the best of, uh, of the summer down there. So congratulations on that. Um, but when we look at the 747, we easily refer to it as an iconic aircraft. Um, there are different aspects to that. It's, it's long service history, the high volumes of production, and of course, it's very distinctive shape. In your view, you know, why does the 747 deserve that label of being an iconic aircraft? I think there's many reasons why it deserves this label. And it starts originally in the 1960s just by its sheer size. And this was a quantum leap in size uh, multiplication and this never ever happened again in aviation history so at the time the biggest aircraft was the Boeing 707 which usually was seating around maybe 189 or uh, that region people uh, some versions had a few more but that was it basically and the 747 initially was already able to carry above uh, now, uh, more than 400 people and it was even more than 600 later. But this kind of quantum leap, more than doubling any existing size aircraft has never happened again. So the, 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 the jump from the 747, for example, to the A380 was much smaller later on. And in many other respects, it was never another leap. And this sheer the, 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 the sheer fact that we actually discussed this today, where we had this amazing event that f almost 54 years to the day after the 747 first flew in February of 1969, uh, and it was still, it still produced until January, or in fact, December 2022. So over half of a century having a passenger aircraft produced and flying and rolling off the line in Seattle, that's also unheard of. And there's probably many other reasons, but I think these two and are probably the most important ones yes. why this aircraft will always be so iconic and probably to have it like top three reasons, the, 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 <clears throat> the, 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 sorry, the sheer shape of the aircraft is yeah. of course so distinct with this very distinct hub, uh, hump, hump on top um, that that's also unmatched by anything else in aviation. So these three reasons, uh, the quantum leap in size, the long FAT and the amazing and unique form and shape, these are the three reasons. Absolutely. And I mean, I know it's a cliche, but I think we can fairly describe the 747 as a game changer in terms of what Boeing achieved with this. I mean, going back to the 60s, they I guess they started work on this in about 1965. As you say, they flew it in 69. Do you think Boeing then could have sort of foreseen the different iterations of this aircraft and what sort of impact it might have? Or were they just sort of experimenting to, to, to see what they could do? I think nobody could have foreseen this longevity and the success, the ultimate success of this concept. Because at the time, um, Boeing and Pan Am as the launch customer were both betting on the future and the sheer existence of their respective companies because this thing was so expensive and it was so incomprehensible how big this whole project was in any respect that it could have easily have resulted in a failure, which would have meant probably both Boeing and Pan Am would have been going out of business. Pan Am did later, of course, but that was by no means the fault of the 747, just the opposite. Probably without the 747, Pan Am wouldn't have stayed in business for so long, but that's a different topic for a different talk. Yes. Um, but of course, these histories of Pan Am and Boeing are fairly closely intertwined. 
Um, but in the end, it was really probably not foreseeable that this concept would, have, would be such a lasting success and really, really revolutionize aviation the way it did. Because that, I think, is another top reason for the 747 being so cherished by everybody, that this very aircraft really single-handedly um, revolutionized air travel in a way never any other aircraft had done, because this was the first aircraft and everybody is stressing this all the time, and it's very true to all my research, that it was really enabling like average people to fly for the first time. It was in the 707 age, like the early golden age of jet, uh, golden jet age era of the DC-8 and uh, 707 mode mostly, at that time was a luxury affair. I mean, look at all these doctor dramas of Pan Am and all the glamour. That was the 60s, basically. And when the 70s started, the 747 came in, it was so big that the airlines had to pull all the strings to fill it, meaning they had to, cheap, uh, they had to sell cheap tickets for the back of the aircraft just to fill it up. Uh, and that really changed the whole thing, the whole concept of aviation being an everyday thing for everybody in an amazing way that also has never been duplicated afterwards. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, so many of us, certainly until recent years, just basically came to take it for granted that we were just entitled to cross the world at some very uh, fortunate, uh, very advantageous price. And the 747 is a big part of that story. So like all good things, I suppose the 747 has had to come to an end. Um, why is that? Because until fairly recently, Boeing, you know, were developing an, a new version, the 747-8. Um, what, what do we think really brought to an end this story and, and, and meant that Boeing felt it had to move on to other things? And that's a very interesting story, especially surrounding the, the, the conception of the 747-8, which was the newest iteration, and it came out around 2010. And I followed the history of this special version quite a bit because I actually know some people involved fairly closely. One of them is Nico Buchholz, who was the Lufthansa fleet procurement chief at the time. And this guy, this German guy, Nico Buchholz, was actually negotiating and then also kind of conceiving the details together with no, no one else than Joe Sutter. Joe Sutter is the father of the 747. I think he passed away in 2016. Uh, I'm very happy and glad and uh, thankful I have met him uh, when he was still around in, in Seattle. And he was a fantastic guy and an amazing character and a legend of the industry, head of the uh, leader of the Incredibles, as they're called, the mm -hmm. people who were actually able to pull this off physically in the late 1960s. But in 2010, Lufthansa wanted it. And Lufthansa kind of begged Boeing, do us a better 747. So they actually incorporated many features that had been developed for the 787. I mean, look at these raked wingtips. Look at the engines on the 747-8. That's all 787 technology. And so that was the idea to transform the, seven, the old 747 concept with an infusion of like 21st century technology from the 787. But in a way, I think everybody was a bit blindfolded because at that time, I think one could have known in hindsight that the age of basically fuel guzzling and maintenance intense four engine long haul aircraft was already over by that time, as Airbus had already experienced at the same time, even before the newest 747 was conceived, as the A380, which had its first flight in 2005 and was meant to be finally a competitor to the 747 after having left the field to this monopolist big aircraft alone for decades. But the A380 wasn't selling well at the time as well. So, and then in the end, almost nobody besides Lufthansa really bought the 747-8i in the Continental, which is the passenger version. Lufthansa flies all 19 of them today, which is by far the biggest fleet. And I think a very few of them are flying with Korean Air and Air China, but a single, small, single digit number in each case. So there was a bit of Lufthansa aircraft from A to Z. And it never got anywhere, basically, besides, of course, the freighters. That was a fairly success story that we see today or yesterday when the last and 1,574th, I memorized this number a long, lot of times, so I have it now in my head and in my heart. And um, so, yeah, freight is very big business, and that was the case also for the Dish 8. So it was not really in vain. 
unlike the A380, which was really an economical flop. I think the 747-8 was in the end okay also economically, as the freighter version was selling fairly well. Not extremely well, but fairly well. Yeah, good point. So in, in some ways, the, the struggles that the A380 had were possibly now the, the first signs that things would not last forever for the 747. Let's just t- touch on a couple of specific points. You mentioned that very distinctive hump on the 747, the eye-catching hump. Now, uh, apart from creating a space for some, some more seats, um, you know, what, what was the particular reason for having that hump? Did it have some sort of aerodynamic significance? Actually, it was never the idea of putting seats up there that might be interesting to hear. And it was only Pan Am's boss, Juan Tripp, who was Boeing's counterpart on the Pan Am side, the then Boeing boss, Bill Allen. These guys, these two guys, like really the big movers and shakers of the aviation industry at the time, they kind of made a handshake agreement on an Alaskan fishing trip. They both did together traditionally. And of course, this famous saying goes, if you'll buy it, I'll build it. If you'll build it, I'll buy it. These two people were communicating with each other. Of course, there was a process of kind of uh, developing, conceiving the actual design. And But it's still interesting to see that some of the DNA of the 747 goes back uh, to a competition by the U.S. Air Force or the military for a new cargo aircraft in the 1960s, which was in the end won by Lockheed with its C-5A Galaxy, which also, as we all know, has this upper deck cockpit. And that was the same reason that the 747 concept had this upper deck cockpit, because it was supposed to load freight through a nose that would hinge upwards and kind of like a big opening mouth, leaving all the cargo in easily rather than having doors. You have to kind of turn containers or difficult. So that was the idea. So in order to facilitate easy freight loading and um, making the aircraft suitable as an efficient freighter, they had to put the cockpit upstairs, both in the galaxy of Lockheed, which ever since flew for the American Air Force, US Air Force, and on the 747, same thing. And that also really much paid off because also for the freighter version, it was always an important freight aircraft, the 747. And it is until today much more than a passenger aircraft right now. So that made sense. And then Juan Trip came along because originally it was just planned to put some avionics base up there, maybe a crew rest. And he said he walked into the mock-up and he said, this will be having a passenger facility up here. We'll do a lounge, we'll do something special. And that was his decree, so that's how Boeing had to follow this order, basically this decree. And that's how this early day and early version, amazing luxury lounges came up, which Pan Am took to the biggest height. I think no other airline other than Pan Am had a really a first class dining compartment up there with table, ta- white tablecloth, linen tablecloth, really actual restaurant tables, uh, a special bar counter where the attendants were preparing the cocktails. But this was really a special amenity and kind of a height of luxury, a level of luxury that was unmatched. And that was something that them wanted to have and they got it and they did it uh, as well as nobody else. Yeah, very good point. You mentioned the luxury there. It uh, brings back memories. Not that I've experienced much of that myself, but Andreas, apart from this this 747 being something that is of great interest to you as a journalist and author, I mean, do you feel you have a sort of an emotional connection with it? Do you have your own memories of this aircraft? Absolutely, yes. Actually, I wrote a kind of a very personal farewell piece in a big German Sunday paper this past Sunday, and many people were actually quite touched by it, and even Boeing, the Boeing German people were congratulating me to that because I think nobody else in their mind or in their opinion had brought it to such uh, easy points, like how really, yeah, the 747 changed people's lives, and in a way it did mine too, because when I was only five years old in Hamburg, Germany, where I grew up, Uh, I kind of dragged my mum into the uh, palace-like Pan Am city office where there was a huge um, 747 model in the window. It must have been around 1971 when the uh, uh, 747 had just been introduced in the year prior in 1970. 
and I begged her to go in and ask for some kind of promotional material for me about the 747. So they actually gave her a very nice brochure, which was actually published in 1969, and which was kind of previewing the 747 experience in detailed, very elaborate brochure. And I still have it to this day. And my mom was getting this, I begged her as a five-year-old in 1971. And then I was, of course, very keen to see it for myself. So when I was around six years old, uh, that was 1972, and um, in Hamburg we had Condor. Condor is this holiday carrier from Germany, still existing today. And they were the world's only and, of course, first airline um, operating two 747s as holiday aircraft. And they actually sat, uh, I think, in the end, they had a seat capacity of 497. It was absolutely a sardine can. I've seen historic complaint letters to Condor how unbearable the seat density was in this aircraft. But they made it, and that, of course, made fly cheap, flying cheaply, cheap to people off the street to buy a flight ticket, which was incomprehensible before and um, unattainable. But then I really saw as a six-year-old, once at Hamburg Airport, we spent some time with the observation deck, how this huge condor yellow tail came up behind the building. I was like, oh, mom, we have to run up again. The 747 is here, the jumbo is here. So we ran up again, and that was... And I was a six-year-old, just uh, awe-inspired by this unbelievable, uh, unbelievably huge aircraft. So there was a very early childhood memory, of course, both these things. And it took some time before I actually was able to fly on it myself for the first time. And that was in 1983, when I was 17, I took my first trip to the U.S., visiting family friends near New York. So I had to go all the way by train from Hamburg to Amsterdam for five hours, and then from Amsterdam, if, and that's much cheaper because I was flying with Royal Jordanian Airlines, Alia Royal Jordanian, on a 747-200 from Amsterdam, JFK, New York. That was in 1983, uh, sorry. And at that time, of course, it was amazing. I was in the economy, economy, of course, it was very luxurious, uh, but I was still very much uh, in awe. And I may actually, I was just kind of tiptoeing through to first class and then up the staircase. I really wanted to see the upper deck. That was my really big uh, uh, achievement. I wanted to take off. And I did that. I actually sneaked past all the attendants and curtains. And it was amazing, although there was no lounge at the time. So there was just seats. So it was not really that impressive as I had seen it in some magazines or, or photos before. But still, I found it absolutely amazing that it's possible to climb a stairwell in a flying aircraft. That was also something I had no idea just how humanity was able to uh, pull something off like this. So that's and then just two more things. Just I don't want to keep this whole audience for hours with my, um, my memories, but... I did at least two very special flights later on the 747. One was a Qantas 747, um, a scenic flight from Sydney down to Antarctica and back. It's like a 14-hour flight. You could book that. I think they even might exist today, but they want to do it on the 787 today. Uh, but there was an Australian, I think it's still there, um, travel company, which was selling like sightseeing flights to Antarctica, not, not touching down, just kind of scenic flights. And, but that was, of course, absolutely amazing. And I was also having access to the cockpit and like talking to the Qantas pilots, seeing how they were navigating with this huge 747 uh, through an Arctic landscape in a fairly low altitude. It was just fantastic. And uh, then the last thing I wanted to mention is a cargo flight I did with Lufthansa Cargo, which was operating quite a few 747, 200 freighters, uh, mostly converted passenger aircraft. And that was probably a bit before, around 2010 maybe, um, I did this flight from Frankfurt to Dakar. And then the flight was going on to Brazil, but I, I left the flight in Dakar in Senegal, Western Africa. Um, but that was just amazing to have this experience flying on a freighter, especially as it was the small upper deck, it was the Dash 200, but there was no wall between the cockpit and uh, some very luxurious old first class seats that were installed in the upper deck for all kinds of, I don't know, cargo attendants or spare crew. So I was like sitting down in this white chair, feet up, and I could see the pilots in front of me working. And I was like living, lying down in my, in my living room on a big uh, uh, chair and kind of enjoying myself, watching out the front window on the other end of the upper deck. And kind of, that was absolutely fantastic. 
And yeah, it's great. Great, it's great to hear the thrill in your voice, even after all these years. And, uh, you know, when I hear you talking about your first experience as a five-year-old, it's easy to see how you became an aviation writer and, and not a dentist or an accountant <laughs> or, or, or something like that. I was um, always envied by many of my peers that I knew very early on what I wanted to do. And there was just this... And I'm still enjoying it today, yeah, as you can Good. see. You're very, you're very fortunate. But we have to say, as much as you love the 747, you're not completely faithful to the Queen of the Skies. I know you have a keen interest in other iconic aircraft. You mentioned the A380, uh, of course, and we all still talk fondly about Concorde. I mean, do, do these iconic aircraft have things in common? And are they the same things that you described at the beginning about how they have to be aircraft that really change things and they have to look different and, that, you know, they, they have to represent some some special moment in aviation history? I think, of course, the Concorde, which is also very dear to my heart, is a different category, so you can't really compare it. Although it's quite interesting that there's actually a very uh, a, a deep connection between Concorde and the 747, they are both what I call the class of 69 because both aircraft had their first flight in 1969. And interestingly, the Boeing 747, during its, its conception and when it was designed and conceived, it was a given, it was a clear thing for everybody that this aircraft is only a stopgap measure to fly passengers until large-scale intercontinental supersonic flying would be the norm. So at the time, at the same time, at Boeing, actually the number one priority was not the 747; it was the Boeing SST, the Boeing Supersonic Transport, also called Boeing 10, uh, 2707, which was absolutely a giant for about 300 passengers up to Mach 3, un unbelievable. And this was where Boeing's top engineers went. So Joe so Sutter, even the now legend at the time, was just heading the B team. Oh, you have to do the 747. The real good guys, they do the SST. And, and then, so there was a given. So the 747 was supposed to be mostly a freighter aircraft after that, when it was expected that, like from the mid 70s, probably humanity would fly supersonic intercontinental and all else, like mostly freight, would go on big aircraft like the 747. Of course, that never happened. Hong Kong was an episode, although an amazing one, so I put on it quite extensively and also did books about that. So Hong Kong is a different matter, although, again, it's the same year of, of first flights and there's many um, much interaction between the both types. But other than that, I think it's hard to match the 747. So, of course, the A380, which is also in a way dear to me because it's built in my backyard in Hamburg, and I know many people who have personally contributed to the, to the A380, and I followed that project very closely as well in this very short period of time comparatively, because the A380 was only conceived in the late 90s, had its first flight 2005, and production stopped in December 2021. So it's a very short period from first idea to the first aircraft being scrapped on the A380. Whereas the 747, of, as we see now, it's a much different and long thing of longevity in comparison. Um, but the A380 definitely lacks the soul of the of the 747 because there's nothing as distinct about the A380, neither inside nor outside, that can actually match this unique experience of, for example, I did that once when I was lucky enough to fly a first class British Airways 747 to really have like a front row number of thing, one A seat on the 747. And when you wake up in the morning and you kind of look almost in front of you, can you really almost like a windscreen when you open your window blind, you can almost look ahead of the aircraft, which is just unique. And also with the upper deck and these things. So the A380 is really more a mass transport. It's an amazing aircraft too, so I will not kind of belittle the A380, but in terms of character, um, the 747, I think, of course, outside Concorde, but otherwise it's just an unmatched. Right. So in that vein, do you think that, uh, you know, today's cutting edge aircraft like the, the Boeing Dreamliner and the, and the A350, when they come to retire, do you think we'll all still be fighting back the tears or will they maybe not have such an emotional connection for us? I think these aircraft are comparatively non-distinct. And of course, they did not involve such, in, I mean, such an inspiring way. I mean, as I was talking online to the Boeing historian Michael Lombardi last week, and he was actually saying that the 747 showed what mankind, what humanity can do and achieve. 
and seeing what they actually were able to achieve with the, in hindsight, primitive tools of the late 1960s, conceiving such a concept that's still valid today, more than half a century later, is really still hard to believe. And all the other aircraft we see now, especially like 787, 8350, they're very nice, efficient aircraft, but they really lack this kind of pioneering spirit that, of course, it was a different age than so now we have all this computer aid design. Everything is very neatly fitting and conceived on computers and in, in cyberspace. At that time, they really were doing all these wooden mock-ups and it was just fairly primitive, but it was just real I mean, it was like a boutique aircraft almost in that respect, the 747 in the 60s. So all these distinction points don't apply to this modern aircraft. And of course, the shape is not very distinct either. It's just this big, big tube with wings on. Um, so it's, it's, it's not the same emotional attach, atten, uh, attachment, I think, that people actually can feel for any of these more modern concepts. Yeah, fair enough. Andreas, you write about different aviation topics all the time in, in newspapers and online. But just to recap for us, what are some of the main main books that you've written um, on, on particular aircraft? Yeah, basically, it's yeah three different things. Uh, one, of course, is Supersonic. I did several books, most of them also in English, um, about the phenomenon of supersonic travel. I have a book out that's also in English. It's published uh, by FlightCon. Um, where actually I can, I have some very rare f f pictures and visuals of the American attempts, like Lockheed, Lockheed and Boeing were competing for the for the for the um, order by the government or for the to be chosen by the U.S. government to be the chosen company of building a U.S. SST by the Kennedy administration in the 60s, and just to see what what length they had to go and what amazing, unbelievable original size mock-ups they built of these gargantuans of aircraft that's unbelievable that were ever flown and not talking about efficiency here. Um, so this is a very fascinating topic beyond Concorde. I mean, I flew on Concorde eight times, which is always the envy of everybody I meet today because that's something most people can not only dream of even flying once or I did it eight times. I never paid for it. As a, young, even as, a journalist, as a young journalist, I was able to have people sponsor that and most of the airlines. So that's something nobody can take off me. And that's really something I, of course, very much cherish. So that's a very special topic in my aviation coverage, all things supersonic. And um, of course, then this, yeah, these phenomenal aircraft, A380, of course, I did the one and only um and I would say monography depicting the whole project from the very first ideas to the first aircraft being scrapped. So that's also interesting for me, which was, of course, also unique, I think, in my lifetime, that a project of this magnitude of like 20 or 30 billion euro development cost as the A380 is really having such a short life in a way, from first idea to first aircraft scrapped and production stopped. And then, of course, most recently, we published this uh, Memories of the 747. It's basically a photo homage to the 747, which, of course, now fits very nicely. And there's another book in store, I've already written, but it hasn't been printed yet, <clears throat> which is a more in-depth book about the 747, like all these amazing um, uh, dealings of the 1960s. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. And, of course, it was a period when I was a small kid. I had no idea about it at the time. But to now do research and uh, sometimes even talk to people who remember these times, um, yeah, it's amazing to see how far humanity and the aviation industry has come in half a century. It is full of wonderment. Uh, I can well imagine that that, that five-year-old Andreas uh, at Hamburg Airport, and if somebody had tapped you on the shoulder and said, Andreas, don't worry, you know, in, in a few decades from now, you, you and your fellow Europeans will be building something almost as grand as the 747 right here in, in Hamburg. It could, couldn't have been foreseen so easily. Andreas Spate, thank you so much for being generous with your time and generous with your memories and your knowledge. We really appreciate that. Uh, this is, as I said at the beginning, a, an epic moment in aviation history, the retirement of the 747, and it was great chatting it through with you. I very much enjoyed it. All the best. Happy landings. 